It is such a darling of Silicon Valley and Wall Street, psychedelics. It's funny because I've been thinking lately about how a lot of this discussion around psychedelics is representing such a mind-body dualism that doesn't always make sense with mental health. Like we're really splitting brain chemistry from experience or like biology from psychological disorder in a way that when you get into the mental health arena, just th those things become mixed really, really quickly. If we're screening out for a history of psychotic disorders, are you screening out for brain chemistry or psychology, right? Like both, obviously. Um, so I think that there are, out, there are questions that we don't know yet about screening, including things that we're going to change as we go along. There's a question right now of if you are on SSRIs, should you stop them before you take a psychedelic-assisted therapy or should you not? Before in clinical trials, they would have people stop them. Now we have some new data that shows that maybe it's okay, you can stay on them, it doesn't really matter. So I think with screening, it's just going to sort of happen as we learn more about interactions and the risk factors associated with psychedelic therapy. But I do agree that in terms of like clinics opening up and retreats and things like that, um, there should be some wariness about just like making sure there's enough like uh, consumer, like informed consent about the kinds of things that might happen. Okay, that's fabulous. I mean, I feel like we've, um, I pushed you guys quite hard on that subject, but I think, I think you summarize it beautifully there, Shayla, that it's really actually, you know, not actually possible to separate out the, the brain chemistry from the experience in this space. And that's part of what makes this conversation so uncomfortable, but also so important to do more work on. So I'm, um, I wonder if we could then start talking a bit more about the practicalities at the present moment. You've all talked about concerns um, about the hype. Um, you know, there's a there's this, it's being touted as being this new mental health renaissance. Um, or is it all just dangerous hype with money as a prime motivator, essentially? Um, Kevin, I feel like you you've spoken to that already, but you know, how exactly do we do we stop that from happening, right? How do we intervene with these things? No, I mean, I think I've said it. I think I think we just have to go slowly and kind of maybe look at some standards. For example, are the you know people who are you know doing research, for example, and this is what something that Iko Fried talks a lot about uh, online on Twitter as a researcher on this issue. Uh, you know, are are the researchers themselves? Are, are all the researchers for the for the studies going on using psychedelics themselves, uh, and have a bias to be very motivated? And that's part of this is like this 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 sort of it takes you know again, and this is where we have to disentangle what's the effective part here because I think a lot of what's happened is happening among both physicians and patients that are both very motivated for positive results. And we know across medical studies that that is a one contributing factor to effectiveness. Uh, and so, you know, we need to we need to disentangle that a bit more uh, again and and really try and keep this more in that medical realm for now as we're learning. And if, if it's if this is about learning, if we agree that it's sort of still nascent stages, um, I, I worry that this is sort of taken often to, um, you know, again, this, this sort of over enthusiasm right now. I just saw that um, Australia talked about how they're going to, um, you know, make psychedelic be one of the first countries to to make psychedelics something that is, you know, much more widespread. And I look at that and then I look at the actual study that that was based that that decision was based on. And the researcher in that study says, that, you know, all of this data does not literally very specifically, apparently, you know, basically I'm paraphrasing, but says that this does not justify widespread implementation as we are still learning. And yet some of the political forces are really pushing that widespread. So I, I worry about forces among some researchers uh, and also among people with for-profit motives, companies, and also, because this is like, such, you know, we should say this is such a darling of Wall Street right now. I mean, let's, we, we need to, I should have said that in the beginning, but it is such a darling of Silicon Valley and Wall Street, psychedelics. I mean, cannabis is old news. It's psychedelics now. Some think it will be cocaine and heroin next, um, because there's all kinds of ways to justify, you know, different things if you're only looking at one side of the coin. So again, I think we need to slow down a bit. Interesting. Matthew, what's your what's your sensation on that in terms of the practicalities? How to how do we be more measured about this? 
Yeah, yeah. You know, I I just think about systems, and it, it gosh, the devil is always in the details. I would argue that for you know, FDA, EMA, Health Canada, et cetera, approval, the you know back to screening, but it's related. You know, for example, we have you know very good, not perfect, but very good guidelines that have really stood up to at this point. You know, thousands of patients, even into the tens of thousands category, with the older and and more modern research, which is not happening at, at virtually any of the retreats, et, et cetera, which is true. And, and there is this conflation of, um, you know, you read you know, a lot of these ballot initiatives, initiatives for local, you know, decriminalization and whatnot, they'll say, oh, look at the work at, you know, literally like, you know, incredible results from UCLA and Johns Hopkins and NYU. And it's like, yeah, after, you know, <laughs> a couple of days of screening and eight hours of preparation and careful monitoring by professionals trained to do this, et cetera. So my, for example, just to be very explicit, I think, you know, we need, you know, with FDA, there's the REMS, the risk evaluation mitigation strategies. If it's approved, MDMA, or psilocybin, it will be approved hopefully with, and I think very likely, this extra set of rules saying, you know, yes, you can use this, but you have to follow these guidelines. Require, and I would advocate that it should; those rules should require you know, something very similar, if not identical, to what the large majority. And there's a lot of consistency across these studies across the planet. We all eliminate, exclude, you know, you know, similar, you know, virtually identical, you know, vulnerabilities. The safety factors are very similar. So if we can stick to that, you know, that's going to be very helpful. And I agree with the, you know, certainly anytime you move into a for-profit, you know, area. Um, you know, there's, you know, perverse contingencies, you know, rule the world. And so we always have to, you know, keep our eye outs for those. However, I am concerned in the psychedelic enthusiast field. There's a whole lot of people with their pitchforks up against late stage capitalism and really just really attacking the fact that someone out there is going to try to make money off of this. And it's, it's like, well, all of the, and yes, I totally understand. I, I view that the same way as the screening questions. Like we need the right regulation. We need the right systems in place to keep things in check. I don't want to get rid of capitalism. We've tried that experiment. It's failed uh, across the planet. We need better systems in healthcare in general. I don't think that we should hold the psychedelic field back from, you know, moving forward, for example, for FDA approval, waiting for, you know, better healthcare in general. It's going to be a struggle. And, you know, that kind of, um, you know, equal access, you know, and insurance coverage, and all of these are going to be questions that experts of those various fields we're going to have to work on, but we can't really hold, you know, we, we, we have to move forward with the, with the system that we have right now while trying to prove the system. I, I mean, some have critiqued the fact that there are for-profit companies. As far as I know, only a single medication has ever gotten to, to market through the, you know, in medicine in general to you know FDA approval through a nonprofit you know only are you 486 but even then was sold to you know handed off to a for profit company so these experiments like with maps are noble experiments that i've supported and i'm a big fan of this pure you know a a a, a largely nonprofit you know kind of carrying this to and providing treatment but those entities themselves have said they don't have the bandwidth to you know bring this to the world so we're going to have to and if we think of the you know, the people in our lives that have been saved through that surgery or through that cancer treatment, all of that's come through for-profit medicine. So it just, it's a nuanced question where we have to really, you know, thread the needle carefully and, so, you know, move forward in the right way. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, Matthew. I mean, you know, you're basically advocating to not throw the baby out with the bathwater immediately. So Shayla, I, I'd like to turn to you to just ask in that case, you know, short of wanting full uh, economic revolution, um, how would you think from the things that, you know, you've read and experienced and written about, how do you think we should go about ensuring that this sort of profit motive doesn't result in 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 these really promising, it sounds like, substances from from reaching their their hopeful goals and and not allowing people to just profiteer off actually the most vulnerable people in our society in any given moment, right? Yeah, well, I, I agree that it's a complicated question if you think about uh, psychedelics as a biotech product, which we are. We're talking about it as a medicine that we want to put through clinical trials, which cost a ton of money, 
Um, I'm very aware of the realities of this, again, as a science journalist. And my parents are research scientists. They work in biotech. I know what that's like. I know the process. You come up with a with a chemical, you get a patent on it. Somebody invests in your company, put it through clinical trials. Maybe it works. Then that's great. Then you have to recoup your investment um, with the people who helped do the clinical trial in the first place. This is the equation that we have to creating medicine, and it makes a lot of really good medicine. And it also can result in um, drug prices that are really high because there's always this incentive to pay back the people who helped you fund the research. And so I think with psychedelics, one thing that's kind of per, like strange about psychedelics is that it has been funded almost predominantly by philanthropy up until very, very recently. We're talking about people making nonprofits and just doing this on donation because it's like, you know, it's legal status, getting almost no research money from the government whatsoever. I think we had like, there was like the first uh, grant from NIMH in 50 years, just a couple of years ago to Matt Johnson's group at Johns Hopkins studying psilocybin for smoking cessation. And so there was just this empty gap in research dollars that the for-profit companies have been able to fill um, and that's basically the only way that people can get their research funded. And so what else are they going to do, right? And so you just kind of end up on this hamster wheel and something that I've been writing about a lot lately. Um, I've been writing about psychedelic patents for the past couple of years and why people need them and why it is that people are trying to get patents that others feel are not novel or that are obvious, which are the requirements for what the patent should be granted towards. And it's just about getting money to do the research. I mean, all of us want more research. This is like the final sentence of any sort of debate or psychedelic talk is like, we need more research. We need more research. It costs money. And so actually what we're going to need is like thinking about where the money is going to come from and alternative finance structures and finance models and thinking about the patent system and, and what kind of ROIs can happen, return on investment and, and what that will leave companies beholden to in order to fund the research that we want. And we just need more government money towards research as well. That's like a, a way to sort of counter the for-profit industry is just to have another pipeline of money coming in. And if we're looking at a future where states continue to pass decriminalization bills or even legalization bills, the return on investment might not be very good. And so the for-profit industry is facing this, um, you know, like, potential conflict where people may be able to just access this in a decriminalized or legalized manner anyway, and they may not be able to recoup their investment with monopoly pricing the way that it happens in other biotech industries. So I think it's going to take um, some pretty like realistic, but also creative thinking, not saying that we have to overthrow capitalism or that patents are bad and we can't, we have to do it all philanthropically through nonprofits, but it will take some, I think, new kinds of financial thinking about what will lead to accessible cheap medicine down the line um, in a way that might be a little different than biotech as it's operated before. Wow. Yeah. I'm really struck by the fact that um, you just said very casually that, you know, decades worth of research has been funded by philanthropic people and organizations. And that really speaks to the power of these experiences clearly, right? I'm assuming that there are people who've had some sort of benefit from the therapeutic benefit from these drugs and that that's part of what's motivating them to do that. I obviously I'm making an assumption here, but I would assume people don't fund things that they don't care about. And so in the sort of last bit of this debate, it'd be really interesting if we could sort of turn our gaze a bit more towards the future. Now, obviously we've said more research is needed. We've To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.